So Samuel's story is interesting. Samuel is a prophet for Israel. And, um, well, I'll just get into his story and we'll kind of just go through it uh, piece by piece here. But Samuel is the son of Hannah, the son of Elkanah, his, fa uh, his father. And what they would do every year, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, um, they would go up to the temple to make sacrifices. This was kind of like, almost like the equivalent of us going to church on Sunday. They would periodically go once a year, and they would essentially march all the way to whatever the closest temple was, and they would make offerings and sacrifices for their yield that year. That's what they did, like, ceremonially. So it wasn't like... Not quite the same as us going to church. You know, we have cars nowadays. We can hop in the car and go 30 minutes to church, no problem. For them, it was like, it was a voyage they would take. So they'd pack all their stuff, all their offerings, everything they're going to do. And they would take this long voyage to the tent the, the, or the temple. So Samuel story starts off with his, with his mom and dad in the Bible. And I'm reading out of the book of Samuel. Shocker. Uh, there's two books of Samuel and uh, just to go back to my timeline for a minute here, what I want to take you guys through is this pe this period of time where uh, God basically calls on Samuel, and then these are the kings that follow him. And so, back to my map here. Um, Shiloh is where they go. And just to give you a little backstory on Shiloh, Shiloh is whenever they... You guys familiar with the Ark of the Covenant? Let me show you a, a cool picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, this is where... Um, Moses had the Ark of the Covenant, and it was designed to host the presence of God. Pastor Rod actually talked about this in detail in his class here in Hebrews. He was explaining to you guys like the way they kept it in a tent. It's kind of like nestled at the back. The Holy of Holies was in the very back. This is the holy place, and the priest would go in once a year to the very back. That was it. Okay, and it was only like one dude was allowed back there. That's how it worked. So this same exact like Moses tabernacle, tabernacle situation. What they used to do is as they would move, Moses would have them break it down. They would move to the next spot and then they would rebuild it. Okay, So it was a, basically like a portable tent that they would move everywhere. Where would they move it? Who would tell them where to put it? Anybody know that? They would move the tent only if God moved. So when God went to move and they saw the, the smoke and the fire would move, then they'd break it down and they'd move the tent wherever he was and they'd build it. See what I'm saying? So they were only basically moving it because they were following God wherever he was taking them, step by step. So once they finally get out of um, Egypt, and now it's Joshua's uh, in charge, God has him build uh, what's called Shiloh. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard that name before, but it's a location that the um, Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle stayed for a very long time. And... Uh, if you go there today, like modern day, this is what it looks like. It's like a tourist attraction. You can go and visit it. Hundreds of years. This is where the, the Ark of the Covenant sat and the tabernacle was built. So it started off like in cloth form and then over time it got a little bit more solidified and they would build walls and etc. And so now today it's some of this stuff that you can go in almost like a museum. And this place down here at the bottom where the flags are. They actually march the soldiers out there and have them do ceremonies. It's, it's a big deal in uh, Israeli culture. So this is where our story starts. Uh, Samuel's mom, Hannah, was on her way up to uh, give their sacrifice like they do every year. And uh, she was having a problem. She wanted to have kids and she couldn't. And so she was praying to God. Uh, Samuel's dad had two wives, and one of his wife would bear him lots of children. The other was barren and could not have any kids. This was Hannah. So Hannah goes to God and says, uh, whenever the time came for um, Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peniah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. This is the wife that has all the kids. But Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb thought that was interesting that it said God was the one that closed her womb. So she's mourning for a son, and she really wants a kid. So she says this prayer, and this is kind of a famous prayer, and I I had an AI rendering of, of Hannah here in the temple doing a prayer to God, but, uh, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Very similar story to the Nazarene bond of 
Samson, right? Like the whole not haircut thing. Anyway, she basically says, God, if you'll give me a kid, I'll dedicate him to, to, the, to the temple. He will work directly for you his entire life if you will give me a son. So she promises to get into a temple, talks about no razor touching his head. She's at the temple praying, uh, but not out loud, it says. She's praying in her heart. And Eli, the, the resident priest of the temple at that time, the guy that's like over watching the temple, sees her. And it says that he, he thinks she's drunk. So he comes up to her like, uh, let, me, let me read it out. Well, he basically says like, are you drunk again? How long are you going to keep this up? This is not good. This isn't a good look for you. And she's like, no, 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 I'm not drunk. I'm praying basically in the spirit to God. And she says, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked him. Uh, and she says, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face is no longer sad. There's a lot of people uh, that I, when I was looking this up online, uh, women that are having a hard time having kids. They really like cling to Hannah's prayers, kind of like the go-to. And there's all kinds of artwork for it, and it, it's pretty cool. Anyway, next day, uh, Elkanah uh, sleeps with Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked from him from the Lord. So that's what Samuel means. It means, it means from the Lord. Uh, they return to the temple the next year. Remember, they go once a year. So full calendar year later, they go back to the temple. and But she doesn't go with him this time. She says, not until he is weaned, so that once he goes, he stays. So she's like, I'm still breastfeeding the kid. But once he's weaned off, uh, I'm going to take him next time, and he ain't coming back. He's staying at the temple. So Elkanah says, okay, whatever. Do what God says. If that's what you feel like God's telling you, do it. So Hannah takes Samuel the next year to the temple along with the bull sacrifice and she tells Eli, the same priest that was there watching the temple, she says this is the kid that I asked God for. I am giving him to the temple to serve God. So they slaughtered a bull, brought the child to Eli and she says oh my Lord, as your soul lives my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition which I have asked of him Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. And this is the whole next chapter in the book of Samuel. It's this very long, pretty cool poem from Hannah, basically just worshiping God and thanking him for Samuel and the privilege to be able to have a son. It's very cool. Then uh, <clears throat> they, the, his parents go back home and they leave Samuel there, basically like a little miniature priest in training. So you can imagine a little like, two-year-old staying with this priest now like his little homie so I don't know I guess Eli feels confident that he can raise a kid <laughs> that young but so the problem uh, it also mentions is that Eli as this is going on right so you have Eli little Samuels here now it says that Eli has wicked sons and this is not good because they're taking bribes and they're not being honest and people sometimes would bring um, offerings to the temple and they would mess with them they'd be like that offering's not very good you need to double it and you need to give half of it to me and they would just like swindle people sort of and finesse them out of some of their resources and so the people didn't like it and they knew that they were wicked so anyway uh, they would they would mess with people when they would go to sacrifice it gives this whole story about how they would burn meat and then they'd be like let us eat some of that meat because they'd be hungry so instead of going and getting food they would just basically jack the sacrifice anyway uh, but Samuel it says but even though this is all going on Samuel ministered to the Lord it says even as a child he wore an ephod and I I know that's a weird word but let me show you what an ephod looks like it's actually pretty interesting the priests were instructed to wear these things over them they were symbolic and it would have these certain stones in them and it was given in scripture in detail to be exactly this it's pretty cool but it goes each one of these stones in that order and so this picture here is a picture of Moses and Joshua worshiping at the ark a long time ago wearing ephods so that's what an ephod was it would lay over the top of your chest it would signify that you're like a high priest. 
uh, that worked at the temple. I thought maybe there's one. Yeah, see, see the little mini guy here? Mm-hmm. We're in the ephod. Okay, so Samuel, imagine him, he's a tiny little kid, has his own little ephod and everything. Uh, his mother Hannah would make him a new robe every year. So every year she would continue to visit the temple, would bring him a new robe every year. Uh, she went on to have three more boys and two girls. And meanwhile, it says the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Um, if I could relate Samuel to a character in the MCU, he'd be a lot like Doctor Strange, if you guys have ever watched any of those movies. Uh, I'll unpack more of that later, but that's to give you a point of reference. Uh, so, this the next chapter is a prophecy against Eli's household, the current priest of the temple. And I, like I said, he has wicked sons. And so this guy, it says a, a man of God comes in and gives him a prophecy, and it says... Uh, It says his sons are sleeping with the women that come to the temple. It's not good. Uh, If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? I always tell people, like, stealing's one thing, but if you steal from God's house, that's a whole other story. I wouldn't want to do that if I were you. I'm not sure what's going to happen to you, but it seems like it would be worse. So he's saying that in Samuel. It's one thing when somebody sins against another, God will judge him. But if he sins against the Lord, like, who's going to intercede for him? So Eli calls them out and corrects them, but it says that they heard him, but they did not heed him. So that I, they heard what he said, but they didn't do it. Because It says, because the Lord desired to kill them. That's not good. It says in Scripture that the Lord desired to kill them. That's rough. And the child Samuel grew in stature and favor with both Lord and men. So... How many of you guys know that's important? If you're sent not to be a Christ follower, it's important that you grow in favor with God and man, right? You go too far one direction, nobody's listening to you anymore. You go too far the other direction, you're not even connected to God anymore. You're so worried about making people happy, you forget about God. You go too far this way, God's happy with you, but you're not talking to people no more. You, you become so strange and alienated that you don't connect with anybody. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. So growing in favor in both God and man simultaneously so that you're close to the heart of God but you're also close enough with people that you can connect the two. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, a man of God comes to Eli and gives him a prophecy. He says, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. This is a prophecy of what's coming in this story. And remember this line right here where he says, because you've been wicked like this, you're going to see an enemy in my house here. That's like, as a priest, that would be like an abomination. Does that make sense? Like, I couldn't imagine somebody desecrating a temple, but that's what's coming. So... Now this sign, this now this should be a sign that you will come up uh, your two sons on Hophius, Hophini, and Phineas, and one day they shall die, both of them. So he's predicting that both of them are going to die on the exact same day. He says, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he will walk before my anointed uh, forever. He will walk before my anointed forever. He's talking about Samuel here. And so you can imagine as he's getting this prophecy, Samuel's probably six years old, maybe. And he's saying, like, this wickedness is not going to stand forever. I'm going to end your house. And the name of Eli is going to be cut off. And Samuel's going to take your place. So Samuel's a little kid still. He's like a little six-year-old, maybe eight years old, something like that. And he's sleeping in bed at night. And he gets his very first prophecy. And if you guys have done any kind of Sunday school, this is one they always tell the kids about. And the moral of the story is that God can talk to anybody. It doesn't matter what age they are. God can talk to little kids. And this is a good example of that. So Samuel's sleeping. It says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And I I wrote down on there that encounters were rare. You know, there's always been times where God's been moving, and it's been real obvious. I don't know, like maybe the Red Sea parting in half and people walking through it. So it's kind of like an undeniable presence of God that you kind of can't refute. There's a pillar of fire coming down out of the sky. You kind of know God's there. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But we had just gone through a period when Samuel's story picks up here where, like, not a lot had been going on. 
And so the idea that a little kid is the one that God's revealing himself to is kind of mind-boggling. Does that make sense? God's been quiet for a long time, and this is how he chooses to show himself. And so you can imagine how Eli feels about this when Samuel comes and tells him. So it says uh, he was sleeping near the holiest of holies, where the ark was. And it says the lamp had not gone out yet. And I I showed you guys this picture, but this little lamp right here... uh, Pastor Rod talked about this last time. It's called a menorah. It's it's a little. It's not really a candle. It's a lamp stand, and they fill it up with oil, and they keep it burning all the time. This is part of their tradition, and it was basically a. As soon as it would get dark, they would burn it all the way till sunrise in the morning. That's how it worked, and they basically never let it go out. Um, there's pictures of the menorah in the background here. This is a picture of a priest, and this is Solomon checking on the temple. But they were they were everywhere. They were like symbolic. <clears throat> And like modern day, this is what they look like now. They still they still do this. So it was kind of like uh, in the story of the scripture here, this kind of lets you know is uh, early in the morning when this happened because it had not gone out yet. So maybe four o'clock in the morning. Um, it says, now the Lord called Samuel and said, uh, it says that the Lord calls Samuel and Samuel answers, here I am. So then he ran to Eli and says, here I am. Did you call me? And Eli's like, no, I did not call you. Go lie down. So he goes back and lays down. Then the Lord called again, Samuel. So Samuel rose up, runs in there to Eli and says, here I am. Did you call me? And he's like, no, I did not call you, son. Go lie down. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And so the Lord called Samuel a third time. He rose, went to Eli and says, here I am. For did you call me? Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy, not him. Therefore, Eli says to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at another time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, your servant hears. Then the Lord tells Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone hears, it will tingle. It's interesting. God tells Samuel he's going to exact judgment on the house of Eli for rebuking uh, for his sons being wicked. Um, The house of Eli shall not be atoned for my sacrifice or offering forever. So it says, Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. So Eli calls Samuel and says, Samuel, my son... And he says, here I am. And he says, uh, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me, all the things that he said to you. In other words, like, don't be cruel. Let me know what God told you. I want, I really want to know. So he says, uh, then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he says, it is the Lord Eli says, it is the Lord. Let him do what he seems good. In other words, like, I accept my fate. I realize that we've crossed the line here. And if that's what God told you, then I just, I guess I got it coming. So it says, uh, some time went by, Samuel grows taller, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail to the ground. In other words, every time God would give him a prophecy, he would simultaneously come through on it. Everything that Samuel said was reinforced by God. It was obvious that God was moving with him. Uh, all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established or confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So this is kind of like uh, his uh, origin story, you could say, like of him being a kid and he grows into a young man. Um, and then there's kind of a story interjected in between these, and they don't tell you this in Samuel, but like if you go read chron- chronologically, there's another storyline. And uh, if you go look at it here, uh, right in between Samuel and Saul is is the story of Samson. And Samson is actually the last judge. And so uh, Samuel grows up um, as a prophet, but he also is a priest in the house of God. And he actually serves as a, as a uh, judge for a while. Remember I explained to you guys that the nation of Israel had judges. They didn't have kings. They had judges. And a judge basically was like the mayor, kind of. They would sit in a tent... And people would kind of bring their affairs to them. And they would sit there one by one and they would judge the situation. They'd be like, hey, this dude stole my cows. 
no, they're my cows. And they'd sit there and go, okay, where does this one, okay, okay, these are yours, these are yours, go on about your way. That's what a judge would do. So it was a tough job that was very taxing. Anyway, the story in between the book of Samuel here uh, is the story of Samson, okay? And Samson is one of the ones I did with you guys. This guy was uh, kind of a wild animal, sort of, that God gave supernatural power to, and it was sort of unearned. I really think it was because of the covenant his parents made. His mom made a covenant with God that she would never cut her son's hair. It was called a Nazarene bond. And he went on to kill many, many, many Philistines and some of the bloodiest stories in the entire Bible. Um, and he's also the one that whenever all the, the uh, Philistine leaders were gathered in one place, uh, it says there's roughly five, 6,000 of them at one time, is where his story ends. And he pushes the temple over and says he kills everybody there, himself included. So he had kind of a short ride, died at roughly 40, so something like that. Judged Israel for 20 years. So this is all in between Samuel being a kid, the entire story of Samson happens, now we pick back up at Samuel's story. Samuel's older now, and uh, some stuff goes on in between here, and I'm going to tell you guys about it real quick, but this was kind of the beginning. It actually says in Scripture that God was going to use Samson to start a war with, he was, he was basically enemies with the Philistines, and I, I did a little research on just the Philistines. I know you guys have heard about them many, many times, like who were they? Um, they're maybe not what you think. When you do a little research, it says that the mass majority of the Philistine people came from Greece. And right around that time, like the Greece, um, the Mycenaean culture had like been failing. This is before Rome, okay? It had been failing and they were like going through economic crisis. So a lot of people fled, okay? And they came across the sea. And it says the Philistines were known as the sea people. And basically what they would do is they would raid all these towns and villages. You see all these X's? These are all the spots that they hit and antiquity that are recorded like so it's not just in the bible like there are evidence of the philistines hitting all these people in fact one of them he hit was ramesses uh the pharaoh of egypt and he annihilated a lot of them because he was very upset that they did that so eventually they end up settling down here in gaza so this is where the philistines come from so everybody in their head thinks of the philistines as maybe middle eastern but they were actually uh of greek descent so and they weren't poor. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of a stat, like a lot of weapons, and they were uh, a pretty advanced civilization. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they weren't like cavemen. They were like well armored. I Man, you, you you know Goliath is a Philistine. You guys know about Goliath, right? It talks about them having copper and metals and the spear that he had and really nice shield. So they were an interesting people, but they were kind of a, a nuisance. And they fought and almost became like the basically the the number one en enemy of israel and they settled in this land here which i made a map for oh here it is it's called philista and these are like the five main capitals and i'm going to explain to you why i'm telling you this in just a second but it's just right outside of jerusalem so they're constantly at war with the nation of israel over territory because they are basically share the same space almost um so these are the five main capitals of the Philistines, and there was a king at every single one of them. And what happens next in the story is a little bit after uh, Samson smashes the headquarters of the temple and kills all the people, years go by and they kind of regroup, right? And they go to attack the Israelites. And it says, um, they... Uh, the Israel, is, uh, Israel's army is defeated at one of their outskirts cities by the Philistines. It says the Philistines kill 4,000 men of Israel on the battlefield. Uh, so the people in the next city hear about this and they start freaking out because they're about to die because they know that as the army marches in, they're next in line, right? So the next city in is panicking. So they think and they have this really good idea. They go, I know what we'll do. Send somebody to Shiloh get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it here and we'll use it to defeat the evil Philistines. And so they do this. They send somebody to the Ark at Shiloh. They grab the Ark, bring it back to the city. And it says the men of Israel were so excited that they yelled so loud that the ground shook. That's how jacked they were. That they had God with them now. And they were going to be able to defeat the enemy. And so the problem is, is that God never actually told them to do that. So it's one of those times where um, you have a really good idea. I watch this happen a lot of times with Christians. They, 
They like want something to be it. So they kind of like take God and leverage it with their idea. Does that make sense? And they're like, this is a really good idea and I like God too. It's like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean God likes that idea. <laughs> just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean your idea that you just came up with, that you get to like take God and pair it with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's important that you go like, hold on a second. Does he actually want me to do that? Or do I want me to do that? Mm -hmm. Big difference in the two. So... They're there, they're celebrating. They yelled so loud the earth shook, and this is how it goes. It actually, is, it's interesting, it pivots to the Philistines for a minute, and it shares what they say. It says, now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us. For such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. It's interesting that they pivot to the Philistines' perspective of what's going on here. But the legend of the ark is long. Right? You remember, Moses happened a long time ago. They're fully aware of the havoc that got wreaked on anyone that messed with the Israelites. Let's put it that way. It says, So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of the God was, ark, the ark of the Lord was captured, and the two sons of Eli were both killed on that day. So this is that prophecy coming to fruition. Remember, he says, because Eli was wicked, he says, an enemy is going to stand in the place of your God and desecrate it. And then here, here we are. This is happening. It says, it is believed sometime right after that battle where they capture the ark that they go straight to Shiloh and smash it. <clears throat> so Shiloh being there all those many years, right after that battle, the Philistines go straight there and they smash the temple down to, to rubble and nothing is left. This is what's there today. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah references this in a prophecy sent to Israel. This is from Jeremiah 7. It says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. You will still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know. And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which was called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But go now by my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did because of the wickedness of my people in Israel. Sounds like God let them have it. <laughs> Sounds like their wickedness was so out of touch that he actually lowered his hand of protection and blessing and allowed the Philistines to sack the city. So now interesting part of the story the philistines have the ark now as this like token of war and they're rolling around with it and they're like i don't know what this thing does but it does crazy stuff let's take it back to our main city because that's pretty awesome we have the basically we got the jews number one weapon of destruction here uh what do we do with it so they take it back to one of their cities i want to say it was akron first i can't remember but let me read it uh, oh it was ashdod so, city of Ashdod, out on the coast there. It says that they take it to the temple of Dagon. Dagon was like their god. And I, I've kind of shown you guys this before. I don't know if you remember it, but they did a movie a long time ago, like back in the 50s or whatever, 60s, something like that, about Samson. And this was like the set. And it was this big temple, Dagon. That's who the Philistines worshipped. It was a pagan god, and that's the temple that, saw, that uh, Samson smashed. Anyway... There are lots of temples of Dagon, right? So there's statues of the guy everywhere. And it says they took the ark and they sat it next to the statue. When they woke up the next day, uh, the statue was like on the ground and broke. Like the head broke off. Mm -hmm. And this happened like several days in a row. They would they would set the statue back up and fix it. And they come back the next day and it would fall over again and the head was broke. So this goes on several times and it says... Uh, Another crazy thing, it falls three days in a row, and it says the Philistines, even to this day, do not walk over the threshold of that temple. I'm not sure what that means, but that sounds like some sub type of omen. Oh, this is like one of the oldest interpretations of that event happening like in record recorded history. It says, 
The hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors. Mm. So, just them being in the proximity of the Ark of the Covenant, they all started breaking out with cancerous tumors. Everyone in the whole city. Um, it says, And the men of Ashdod saw how it was, and they said, The Ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. His hand is harsh towards us and Dagon our God. Therefore we sent it and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What are we supposed to do with the Ark of the God of Israel? We don't want this thing in our city. Get it out. Get it out. It's giving us cancer. We don't like it. So it says they take it down to Gath. Okay, if you know anything about Gath, this is the hometown of Goliath. This is where his family is from. And there's a whole more to the story I'll tell you guys later. But there were a whole pack of giants, the sons of Rapha. That's who Goliath is part of that family. Anyway, the people, they take it to Ekron, and the people of Ekron say, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel to kill us. <laughs> they vote to send it back to the Israelites in Jerusalem. It says it was with the Philistines seven months. Uh, they roll up to Jerusalem. So in other words, it makes its rounds in these cities, and like, we don't want this thing. Send it back to the Israeli people. We don't want it. It's a curse. So they go to one of the cities on the outskirts here, and it's... The best way to describe it is they kind of yell at a distance, like, hey, we don't want this thing. We want you guys to take it back. We've obviously made your God mad, though. How should we go about doing this exchange? And so the priests yell back, send it on a cart, take two cows that have never been yoked before. You guys have no yokes are like things you put on the cow's neck and they pull the plow with it. So it's kind of like baby cows, sort of. That would be innocent, I guess. And they're like, two cows, cart, put the ark on top of it, and then to the side of it, put a little box. And this is the weirdest instructions ever. But he says, go and make golden casts of the tumors and the rats that are eating all y'all's grain. Because they were cursed with rats, too, which is odd. <laughs> so they say, make golden representations of them. Put those all those golden things in a box and ship it next to the ark. And what we, what we want you guys to do, and they're like, if you're lucky, God will forgive you. If you do all this right and you're lucky, God will forgive you. Well, they've been so struck with the tumors, they're like, we'll do whatever. Y'all want us to make golden? Fine, we'll do it. So they do it. And they tell them, they said, uh, the priests say, do not return it empty, but with a sacrifice and God will forgive them. The Philistines ask what the offering is. It says, make five golden tumors and five golden rats according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. This is all five cities. It says, uh, Images of the rats that ravage your land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel, and perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. So they do what they ask, and the priests say, uh, send the cart on its way, and then if it comes up to the city, you'll know that God has officially removed the curse from you. So it says they send it, and it says that all five of the kings from these cities follow this cart, like watching this dumb thing, because they're like, come on. <laughs> Go to the right city. And it does. It says it goes up to the right city. And this is where the story gets maybe even stranger. <clears throat> but it goes to a city called Beth Shemesh. And the story of the people of Beth Shemesh uh, contributed to one of the wildest scenes of Bible relics in any movie. I mean, if you guys are old, like I am, I realize... Uh, this movie was made in 1981. Okay, I watched it on VHS when I was a kid. But it's Indiana Jones and the Last Cru I mean, the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay? So, there's a scene at the end where the Nazis capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take it to an island. And they have this great idea that they're going to open it up because they want to see the, the magic or whatever. So, these dudes... Um, I got, I got some slides here. Here we go. Okay, so we got these Nazi leaders. They think it's a great idea to open up the Ark of the Covenant. Well, Indiana Jones knows his history, okay? He knows about the story I'm about to tell you all from Samuel. And he tells the girl he's with, he's tied up, and he tells her, like, whatever you do, don't look. Keep your eyes shut. And she's like, what are you talking about? He's like, just, just do it. Just don't open your eyes. Don't look. So the guys open the thing. Stuff comes out like, wow, it's so beautiful. And he's like, I don't care what they say. Don't open your eyes. And he's, you know, he's keeping his eyes shut. And all of a sudden, this lightning starts going through the whole camp of the Nazis and like shocking through them. And they literally like, they all get melted and killed immediately. So every single Nazi dies and is basically vaporized. And when it's all said and done and the ark shuts itself back again, Indy and the girl wake up and they leave the scene. So it's wild. There's even a scene where this dude's like looking right in it and it like melts his face. It's trippy. I would show it to y'all, but I feel like it's not church. 
Uh, but this is based on this story. Let me read this next part. It says, whenever the ark came in, and I have a, I've kind of like an artist rendition of this. As they saw the ark coming in to the city, they rejoiced. They're like, yay, the ark is back. We're happy. And then they have the great idea to open the ark and look on the inside. And it says, he, he then struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Wow. Pretty wild. But that whole Indiana Jones thing was based off of that scripture right there. When the people of Beth Shemesh got a little too curious and they decided to open it. Uh, the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? In other words, like we don't know what we're doing. And we don't want this thing around us because we obviously don't know how to handle it. We have, we have made a huge mistake taking it out of the temple that God told us to leave it in. So it says, Then the men of kirith Jerem come and take the ark of the Lord into a house of Abinadab on a hill and consecrated Elzar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And it stays there the next 120 years. And... This is where it stayed for the next 120 years. It's kind of like a full-blown city now, but this is the church. And if you go there literally today, um, there's a church there called Our Lady of the Ark of the Covenant Church. And this is where it sat for the next 120 years. Pretty cool. So back to Samuel here. That was like the little in-between part. Uh, Samuel is now a confirmed prophet and a judge of Israel. Uh, it says that uh, he's now leading Israel. He tells them to get rid of their idols. And Baal and Dagon and turn back to God. He summons all of Israel to the city of Mizpah and speaks to them all at once. Um, he prays for them before the Lord and they all fast and they cry out for redemption. So Samuel basically brings them all in and goes like, you've got to get right. Serve the God of Israel, the one that uh, was with Moses when he brought your grandfathers out of Egypt. You have to turn back to God and the people do that. It says the Lord... While this is happening, the Philistines learn of them gathering and decide to attack. So they find out that Samuel's gathered them all, and they're like, sick, this is an excellent time to attack. They're all in one spot. They hear about the Philistines coming. It says, uh, Samuel hears of the army on the way and takes a lamb and sacrifices in it and asks God to help. It says, the Lord hears him, and as the Philistine army approaches, the Lord strikes the air with a loud thunder, confusing them. The men of Israel see this happen, seize the moment, and run the Philistines away. So I guess the thunder was so loud that it just stunned all of them, and they didn't know where they were at, and they, they ran them all out. So God saves them. And it says that Samuel sets up a... It says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us, or in other words, um, the stone of help. And it was an altar, a reminder to remember the time that God stepped in and, and bailed them out and saved them. After that day, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. In other words, uh, they stopped attacking while Samuel was over them because God was basically keeping them at bay and changing their ambitions and making them not want to attack. It says, with the Philistines now subdued, Israel reclaimed all of its territory and also finds peace with the Amorites. Uh, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life uh, and went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and judge Israel in all those places. So he basically was like the priest or the prophet and would lead Israel for that little window of time. And he would tour all their major cities, kind of like keeping things in line and, and leading them. There he judged Israel and built an altar to the Lord. So, last part. I got ten minutes. I'm going as fast as I can. This is the last part, and we'll pick up next week. But Israel demands a king as the next chapter, and this is where I'll finish with this last one. But they want to be like all the other nations. They want a king for themselves, and they're tired of the whole judge system. And they want to be cool, like the cool kids. All the cool kids have a king. It looks awesome, and he has a really nice palace, and it's fancy, and the, the king's handsome, and looks really good. And that's what they want. They want a king that they can see with their eyes, even though the whole time, who was their real king? God, right? God was their king. God had been delivered on this whole time. So this idea doesn't sit well with Samuel. He's kind of offended for God a little bit, going like, you don't need this earthly manifestation of what you think in your head. God has been your king this whole time. You are actually wicked for requesting this. It shows how much you don't trust him, and it shows how materialistic you are, that you want to be like everybody else.
So, it says Samuel's getting old and he decides to set his sons as judges over Israel, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. And so that's partly what led them to it. Uh, then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, which is where he lived, and said to him, Look, you're old, your sons are idiots, now make us a king to judge like all the other nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord that night, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I have brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice, however you shall solemnly, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of a king who would reign over them. In other words, you need to let them know what they're actually asking for. I don't think they actually know what a king's going to demand of them. So go let them know what having an earthly king looks like. And so Samuel goes before the people and he brings them together, big huge meeting with the whole nation, and he says, this will be the behavior of a king who will reign over you. Since you guys are stubborn and you want this so bad, God's going to give it to you. But let's make no mistake, this is what it looks like when you have an earthly king. It says, uh, he will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen. And some of them will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his household, over his thousands, and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow the ground and reap his harvest, and some to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will then take your daughters and turn them into perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage, which was wine, and give it to his officers and servants. And then he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and he will put them to his work instead of yours. He says, uh, and, he, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you. In other words, like, fine, I'll give it to you, but don't come crying to me when you don't like the results of this. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may be also like the other nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. So Samuel sends everyone home and sets out to find Israel's first king. And that's where we will pick up next week at Israel's first king. So that is Samuel in our Bible study, the prophet and the priest and the leader of the people of Israel temporarily before they get their very first king. And God is going to use Samuel to anoint Israel's first king. And the reason I'm telling you guys all these people's stories because they, they all kind of overlap. Samuel's story doesn't necessarily end here. But the, the uh, focus of our story canon, remember the overarching story, it's going to shift to Israel's first king. And we're going to cover that next week. So let me pray and then I will let you guys go. Father God, thank you again, God. Um, be with everybody in this room, Father. I pray that uh, they, they heard exactly what you needed them here, God, that, that uh, the parts of the story, God, that they can identify with. Um, we have to walk out being Christians, God, and walk out having you in the, in it, like intertwined into the stuff that we do, God. So give us uh, eyes to see and ears to hear uh, the lessons that we need to learn from uh, the people uh, that are following you just like we are, God. We're doing it uh, just at a different time, but we're following the same God uh, the same way. And so give us eyes to see and ears to hear uh, and l let our spirit pick up on what you need us to to say. God, we're, we're privileged to be able to come into your house like this and study your word, God. Study you and get to know you better. Um, we're grateful as always, Father. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you guys. See you next week.